is that you think. Many of you are probably university students and you're accustomed to some level of thinking, but there's a different kind of thinking required when grappling with biblical issues. And so I ask you, think rigorously, think microscopically. Isaiah 118, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father in heaven, thank you for life day, God. I really mean that genuinely. Thank you for physical strength and health. Thank you, Father, that despite restrictions in some countries, there's still general worldwide freedom to preach the gospel. And particularly, Father, through this medium, the gospel can go easily where previously it perhaps could not go. We thank you for that. Help us always to make the best use, Father, of this technology. Bless those who arranged it, dear God, wherever they are, whatever their station in life, bless them for coming up with this idea. Father, in a very individual way, touch everyone listening to this program. Our needs vary and differ, but you're the same God. Whatever our concerns are, Father, you have the answer. Because nothing is impossible for you, Luke 137. I ask you, Father, pour out a very special blessing on those who are not Seventh-day Adventists, but who have honored us by their presence. Please, God, touch their lives in every possible way. And Father, for all your children, keep them from the coronavirus, dear God. If any one of them has contracted that terrible virus, I'm asking you, in the name of Jesus, the great physician, who healed everyone who came to him when he walked this earth, touch those afflicted bodies, Father, and deliver them from that virus. And having delivered them, dear God, may they recommit their lives to you and to your service. Now, Father, put your words in my mouth. I cannot forget to ask that you bless every country represented by this audience, God. Bless the leaders, direct their minds that the decisions they make may bring somehow glory to your name and allow the gospel to advance in that country. Now, Father, speak through me. Forgive my sins. Use me, dear God. I will not object. I will not resist. Just use me, Father. Tell me what to say, how to say it, when to say it. To 23. And that has nothing to do with in the beginning, but... Uh, we go to Matthew 23. We read from verse 29. We're looking at something that Jesus said to the Pharisees. Matthew 23. In verse 29, Jesus says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous. Jesus is telling the Pharisees in his day, essentially, you are as guilty of the blood of prophets killed in the Old Testament as those who physically kill them because you have the same attitude. And so he tells, he says, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous. In other words, you take care of the graveyard where the dead prophets lie. You make sure the sepulchres are whitewashed so that they look nice. And you say, verse 30, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. So the Pharisees told Jesus, we would never have done that. Wherefore be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which kill the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers. You are just as guilty as they are. O serpents, generation of vipers, how can he escape the damnation of hell? Now listen to the next verse. Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom ye shall kill and crucify, some of whom shall ye scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. Next verse. That upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth. Jesus is saying you are just as guilty for the blood of all righteous people, even though you did not physically do it. But I continue the verse, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth. And it begins with the first righteous person who died. From the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Barachias, the son of Zach Zacharias, whom he slew between the temple and the altar. Now, why did I refer to that passage? Let's look at that verse 35 microscopically. Jesus mentions 
Abel as the first righteous person to die. In Hebrews 11 verse 4, the Bible says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Paul tells us that Abel was righteous. Jesus says Abel was righteous and Abel was killed. Jesus accepts as a historical fact that Abel was killed, which means that Jesus Christ accepts the events of the first chapters of the Bible as historical. And this is very, very important. Now, using our common sense, if Jesus Christ accepted Abel as a historical figure who lived and died, and the Bible says he was killed by Cain, his brother, then Jesus also accepted the reality and the historical nature of Adam and Eve. And so we're working our way back. Christ accepted as literal the events mentioned in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, all the way to 11 as a start. He accepts the entire Old Testament, but we're just focusing on the first three chapters and on a wider level, uh, up to chapter 11. Go with me now to Luke 17. We'll read from verse 26, our subject in the beginning. Luke 17, reading from verse 26. And as it was, and as it was in the days of Noe, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. Now Christ is talking about the days of Noah. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. What does that tell us? Christ accepted as a fact that there was a worldwide flood. He accepted as a fact there was a man called Noah who preached. He accepted that. Many Bible scholars today dismiss the historicity and that fancy word historicity means that it was real, it actually happened. Bible scholars res, uh, object to the historical nature of Genesis chapters 1 to 11. Jesus accepted those events as actually having happened. Let's stay in Luke 17. We go to verse 28. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. Until the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire from brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Jesus accepted the account of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and Zeboim and Adma as having actually happened. Why am I stressing this? Christ accepted the historical nature of creation. Many people don't understand or realize that you remove creation and you remove everything. You remove creation and the gospel collapses. There's no need for a gospel. You remove creation and you remove God. The Christian must understand that creation is an actual event that occurred and no less a person than Jesus Christ himself accepted creation as literal. Now, Jesus had a half-brother called James. Let's go to James chapter 1. We shall read a verse 26. James 1 verse 26. James says, for as the body without the spirit is dead. James 2 26, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Now, James, the half-brother of Jesus says, James 2 26, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Now, where did James get that? He got that right out of Genesis 2, verse 7, which says this. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. The half-brother of Jesus Christ, James, is alluding to the fact that there was an actual creation of a man made of dust, and breath was breathed into that man or that thing, and that beautifully carved thing from dirt became our father, Adam himself. Jesus accepted the reality of the events of the first 11 chapters of Genesis. The apostles accepted it. If you read 2 Peter chapter 3 or 1 Peter, 2 Peter, you'll find where they refer to events that occurred in the early stages of this world's history. 
Now, I said earlier, remove creation and you remove God. If I continue any further, let me pray again. Father in heaven, as I continue with in the beginning, I'm asking you, God, control my mind. I give you permission to control my mind because I do have a carnal nature. I give you permission, God, to suppress, take my carnal nature by the throat and throttle it into submission so that only the spirit of God can use my speaking apparatus. And let my words be simple and clear. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Remove creation, you remove God. Let's go to uh, Colossians chapter 1. We read verse 16. Colossians 1, verse 16. We'll also read 17. Here's what the Bible says. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Let's read those two verses again. We're looking to see how often the expression all things occurs. For by him were all things created, that's one, that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things, too, were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, verse 17, number three, and by him all things consist. Now, Paul is hammering home the point. The stars that you see, the molecule you cannot see, the wind you feel but cannot see, the gravitational force you feel, perhaps, if you jump off a building, but you cannot see, the process of photosynthesis we see because the leaves are there, the trees function, they stay alive. We cannot see, but we accept it happens. All these things are upheld by God. For those of you doing science, when you contract a muscle, all the micro steps required in a microsecond for you just to do that, all of that is upheld by God. Remove the creator and you begin to realize the universe collapses which has always been Satan's plea. You see his desire to take God's place. God's law is order. Satan's is chaos and disorder. You remove the creator and you remove life. You remove the creator and you remove harmony. You remove the creator, you remove order. You remove the creator, you remove God. That's why evolution is the act of evicting God from the universe. Of course, it can never succeed because God will not allow himself to be evicted from that which he himself built. As verily, as you and I would resist any attempt to be evicted from our own houses for which we paid or which we built. In the beginning, let's go to Genesis 1. We read verse 1. Genesis 1, verse 1, our subject, in the beginning. And we're highlighting creation and science and the Bible. And all three fit like fingers in a glove. Creation, science, and the Bible all fit like fingers in a glove. Genesis 1, verse 1, let's take a look at God. That verse says, 10 little words, but they're encyclopedic in their significance. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. I ask you to listen microscopically, do that now. In the beginning, whenever that was. But whenever the beginning was, God had to have been there before the beginning in order to do what we're about to read in the rest of the verse. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That verse introduces us to a time, the beginning, a person, a personality, God, an activity created, and a result, heaven and earth. Let me go over that again. We have a time. We have a power that preceded that time. We have an action, creation, created by that person or done by that person, and then we have the outcome. Right in Genesis 1.1, by the way, is my favorite verse in the Bible. But let's look at the verse again and see what else we see. In the beginning, 
we have time. God created the heaven, we have space. And the earth, we have matter. Space, time, and matter. All preceded by God. In order for God to make them, he had to have been there before they existed. Simple reasoning, simple common sense. In the beginning, time, God created the heaven, space, and the earth, matter. The God of the Bible is outside, is not confined by time, space, or matter. Let's go to Psalm 115. Let's read verse 1. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name. Give glory for thy mercy and for thy true sake. Wherefore should the heathen say, where is now their God? Listen to what the psalmist says. But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. This is an omnipotent God. He can do whatever he likes. He's not dictated to. Our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, it pleased him to make the heaven and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And we saw a time, a personality, God. We saw an activity, creation, and we saw the result, heaven and earth. Then we looked at the verse again, and we saw in the beginning, time. God created the heaven, space, and the earth, matter. And we are coming to the conclusion, and I want you to consider this that the mighty God of the Bible is the God who stands outside of time, space, and matter. Evolution cannot tolerate that or even understand it. There's something interesting about the Bible which you don't find in scientific research. Here's what I mean. You read any scientific paper, they seldom say research proves anything in order to cover their tracks in case another study shows something different, which is frequently the case. Scientific papers tend to say research suggests, research indicates, research tends to show. God does not suggest anything. God declares. The Bible is a book that begins with a declaration, not a suggestion. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That is a declaration. God doesn't try to prove he is God. He simply says he is God. I created the heaven and the earth. If you get rid of creation, you're effectively trying to get rid of God, the God of creation. Let's take a closer look at creation and the creator. As we continue looking at creation, science of the Bible. Genesis 1 1. Well, Genesis, let's read from 1 1 to 3. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. We have another personality introduced, the Spirit, but we won't talk about him. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. When you get rid of creation, you get rid of the word of God, because the entire universe was made by the word of God. I pause for you to reflect microscopically. The entire universe was made by the word of God. To question creation is to question and perhaps eliminate the reality of God's word in your own life. You cannot eliminate God's word from reality. You can eliminate God's word from your life to your eternal loss. Genesis 1-3, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. Remove creation, I say again, and we destroy God's word for our own selves, those of us who think we can get rid of creation, who think we can evict God from the universe he created. God created by his word. And so when you tamper with creation, you are tampering with the word of God. Psalm 33, verse 6. 
by the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast by the word of the Lord were the heavens made. Psalm 33, 6. Hebrews 11, verse 3. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. We have God's word inseparable from creation because it was the word that produced the heaven and the earth and the universe. Creation, the Bible, and science. We see the connection between the Bible and creation. Creation was done by the word of God. My favorite writer outside of the Bible is the lady called Ellen White. She lived from 1827 to 1915, served the Adventist church with remarkable faithfulness. In a book written by her entitled Education, she makes this statement on page 15, paragraph two. No, page 126, paragraph four, sorry. Page 126, paragraph four of the book Education. The creative energy that called the world into existence is in the word of God. This word imparts power. It begets life. Every command is a promise. Accepted by the will, received into the soul, it brings with us the life of the infinite one. The infinite one is God. What is the author saying? The life of the very life of God is in his word. That's why if you remove creation, you remove the word, you're removing God. The very life of God is in his word. That's why the word could create living things. This word imparts power. It begets life. Every command is a promise. Accepted by the will, received into the soul. It brings with us the life of the infinite one. It transforms the nature and recreates the soul in the image of God. How can the word recreate the soul in the image of God? Because the word of God contains the very life of God, the very righteousness of God, the very character of God. That's why the word can reproduce that character in us. Get rid of creation, you get rid of the word. You get rid of the life of God in your own life. Creation, the Bible, and science. My listening friend, in Matthew 6, from verse 25, before I go into that verse, let me pray again. Father in heaven, I'm asking you in the name of Jesus Christ, a name you always accept. Tell me what to say to God and how to say it because I am not a wise man. I'm trusting you. Do it, Father, not because I ask, but do it for the sake of those listening that all they may hear from me is truth as it is in Jesus. In his name I pray. Amen. Matthew 6, verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought? can add one cubit to his stature. Verse 28, and why take ye thought for Raymond? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. What is Jesus saying? He mentions birds in verse 26, the lilies of the field in verse 28. Jesus is saying the creator is the one who takes care of birds. If you are an ornithologist, those are the experts in birds. Your botanist plants flowers. Christ is saying that the creator is the one who takes care of birds, who takes care of flowers. He goes on, for, what about grass? He even refers to grass which today is and tomorrow. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, what does he mean by God so clothed the grass of the field? Now, this is not symbolic language. The word clothed may be poetic, but it's nonetheless literal. Let me pause and explain. That's why you must read the Bible microscopically. How does God clothe the grass? Well, grass is almost always green. 
What makes grass green, the leaves green? Chlorophyll, which is part of the structure of the, uh, the leaf. Who controls the processes that maintain that? God. All of that can be seen in the words of Jesus Christ. If God so clothed the grass of the field, it is God who keeps grass green. It is God who gives color to the flowers. God is scientist number one. It is God who instituted the laws of aerodynamics that allow a bird to fly. It is God. I fly a lot all over the world preaching and I'm always grateful for the laws of aerodynamics. There's a principle called Bernoulli's principle, which says that the pressure under a wing is greater than above because the air flows faster above than it does underneath. Consequently, the pressure is greater under them than above. And this is one way the wing is pushed up. Of course, there are other forces required for flight. Where did those laws come from? Did Einstein create them? Did Newton? Did Johann Kepler? No. These were put, the very first instant birds appeared, the laws of aerodynamics took effect. Because God is the curator. He is the supervisor. He is the preserver. He is the maintainer of creation at the macroscopic level and at the microscopic level. And so Jesus says, if God so clove the grass of the field, botanists pause on that verse and be in awe that the God of heaven and earth takes time to maintain by his word the processes that keep grass and leaves green or whatever color they may be. If God so clove the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven. It is not, grass is not insignificant to the creator. It's here today, gone tomorrow. Faith in God, then, according to the words of Christ, must rest on the fact that he is the creator. He not only brought it into existence, it is he that maintains what he made. When we learn that lesson, then when we come to Christ and he makes us over, he has an obligation that he imposes on himself to take care of us. Creation, the Bible, I'm not a scientist. I'm not an apologist. I'm not an expert defender of truth. I just love to present the word of God as simply as I possibly can, hoping that those listening will exercise honesty. One of the major requirements for understanding the Bible is not a PhD in Hebrews, but plain and simple honesty. Creation, the Bible, and science. Let's go back to Genesis 1. We read verse 3 again. But let me pray one more time. Father, please, God, do with me whatever you like as I speak. I hope that will be that you talk through me. Literally, let my voice be yours, dear God. Please, in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Let, let me explain why I pray all the time during the message. Even though someone has come to Christ, that person still has the carnal nature. The carnal nature will only be destroyed when Jesus comes a second time and this mortal puts on immortality. The finest Christian on earth still has the carnal nature, which is always trying to push its head up. And constant prayer is required to keep that head submerged until Christ comes to absolutely drown it. And so I feel the need to constantly pray. Genesis 1 verse 3. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. You forget rid of creation. You know who you get rid of? Jesus. Because it was Jesus who said, let there be light. The same man who walked this earth and traveled in a boat and ate bread and fish and walked with the disciples and asked the woman at the well for water. It was he who said, let there be light. And I can hear you say, what do you mean by that? Listen to God the Father speaking to the Son in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 10, where we read from verse 8 to verse 10. This is God the Father speaking to the Son, and the whole universe is eavesdropping. We are listening to God the Father himself speaking. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. That's what the Father says. Verse 9, thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Let's skip to verse 10. 
And thou, Lord, in the beginning has laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the works of thy hands. The Father, whom no one questions, that he is divine, he cannot lie. He tells the Son, you are the creator. It's biblically correct that Christ functioned as an agent of the Father, but it was Jesus Christ who led out in creation. The Father said, and thou, Lord, in the beginning has laid the foundations of the earth. Listen to John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the word, that's Christ, because verse 14 says the word became flesh. Let me slow down. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the word. Who is this word? John 1, 14 tells us, and the word became flesh. It wasn't the Father who became flesh. It wasn't the Holy Ghost. It was the Son. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. The word was God. Plurality and equality. All right. Verse 2 says, the same was in the beginning with God. Verse 3, all things were made by him. Mm. That's the word. Christ. All things were made by him. And without him. Was not anything made that was made get rid of creation and you get rid of Christ the creator. You get rid of the cause of everything except sin. The Bible creation, the Bible and science. To remove creation is to remove Christ. Is to remove the concept of true worship. Why do I say that? Let me say it again, then I'll explain. To remove creation is effectively to remove Christ from the life of the person trying to remove him, which is also to remove true worship because there is false worship that does not require God. Why is the removing of creation the removal of true worship? When, I'll ask this question, before there was sin in the universe, there were angels, before the devil became the devil, he was Lucifer. He was a sinless, perfect angel. Sin began with him mysteriously. But before there was sin, just living beings, and the Bible says in Psalm 148 verses 1 to 5, that the angels were command, made by the command of God. God just spoke and they came. Remarkable, difficult for the finite mind to understand. But the Bible said, thou commanded and they were created. Angels were created by the word of God. This is a powerful word. They came out of nothing. That's what God's word can do now. Before there was sin, there was worship. I said remove creation. You remove the basis of true worship. Before there was sin, there was worship. In other words, before the need for a savior arose, there was always the requirement of worship because there has always been the creator. When the very first intelligent being was made, worship began. When that was, nobody knows and nobody needs to know. All the angels that existed before sin, they worship God. And so when God sent a message to disobedient Saul, Samuel said to Saul, speaking for God, hath God delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearten than the fat of rams. What is he saying? God prefers obedience to all the sacrifices people offer. Why? Because obedience existed before sacrifices were required. And obedience is the very heart and soul of worship. That's why the Christian needs to understand worship isn't something you do on the weekends. Worship is a lifestyle of obedience to God. Worship is the way you dress. Worship is the way you eat. Worship is the way you conduct your romantic relationship. Worship is a life we live, not just two hours in a church building. And the foundation of that worship is obedience. And the foundational reason to obey God is not that because Christ died on the cross because there was obedience before there was Calvary. The foundational reason is he is the creator. And so Revelation 4 verse 11 says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Why? For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Creation is the foundation of worship. Creation is the foundation of obedience, and obedience and worship are virtually the same thing. Remove creation. And who is there to worship? Trees, 
<laughs> rocks huh? that people say evolved animals and some people do worship animals i mean god bless egypt but his, the egyptians historically in the days of the bible at least they worship the cat they worship the hawk they worship the dog they worship the, the crocodile they worship the river nile there are people in some countries i don't want to mention anymore where they worship a particular river they worship a tree they worship a mountain they say that they worship a rock all of this occurs when the creator is removed from the center of a person's consciousness he who brought these things into existence is ignored and the creative thing is worshiped this is what happens when the creator is removed romans 1 25 and turning the truth of god in a, into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator, which is what most of the world does. My listening friend, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And I told you to work your way back. If Christ believed that uh, Abel was a historical figure, then we must believe Adam and Eve were his father or his parents, and then God made them. You work your way back. Let's work our way back in something else, and then I'll come to close. When God spoke to Adam, let's go to Genesis 3. We read from verse 17. We'll work our way back to see what honest reasoning can lead us to conclude. Genesis 3, let's read from verse 17. Let me pray, Father. I'm coming to the downslope of the message in the beginning. Continue to be with me, please. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Genesis 3, verse 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and has eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth unto thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. He reading, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it was thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. Now, the Bible tells us dead people eventually, or anything dead, a person, an animal, returns to dust given enough time. Dust. Now, we we're talking about working our way back, reasoning backward. And the word backward there is used in a favorable way. Reasoning backward. In other words, if Christ believed Abel actually lived, then you work backward. He had to believe in his parents, Adam and Eve. You work your way backward. You have to believe God made them. You had to believe there was a Garden of Eden. You're working your way backward. All right. The Bible says the dead people, they become dirt after a while. After four days of death, of being in a tomb, Martha told Jesus, Lord, by now he stinketh. Lazarus had begun to decompose to go back to dirt. Now, you go to any graveyard where someone has been there for a while. My mother died two years ago. My father died uh, 13 years ago. My brother died about 10 years ago. I understand death. You go to the grave of someone who's been dead for a while you'll find largely dirt. And given enough years, the bones will deteriorate as well. Some things take longer than others. Given enough time, the hair will deteriorate. The only thing eternal is God. If a graveyard dug up yields dirt, and that's what the Bible says, then surely let's work our way back then. If the Bible is correct about what happens to people when they die, then the Bible must be correct about how people were made. Genesis 2 7 and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground he didn't evolve if evolutionists will accept that a dead person eventually becomes dirt and that's what the Bible says then surely a little honest reasoning will lead you to say let me work my way backward if the end of a person can be can be uh, determined from the Bible and the end being dirt then that same book says here's how the person began why would I accept what the Bible says about how a person ends, but not accept what the Bible says about how a person begins? Let me slow down again. We're working our way backward. If the Bible says dead people become dirt, the Bible also says living people were made from dirt, then surely if we accept one, honesty should lead us to accept the other. The Bible says the creator made Adam from dirt the dirt. Remove the creator. You remove humanity. Remove the creator. You remove reality as it can be comprehended by a finite mind.
My brother and sister who's listening, there is no credit to trying to get God out of the universe. There's no benefit from casting God out of your life because God is life. There is a God, there is a creator, and the world is surrounded by evidence of this God. I'll give you two Bible verses, then I close. In Psalm 19, verse 1, the Bible says, the heavens declare the glory of God. Now, you study the Bible carefully. The glory of God is the character of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. In other words, if you examine the heavens, particularly at night, and even during the day, if you can stand the glare of the sun, you see the stars, they're usually the same place night after night. That's why mariners can navigate the oceans by the stars. They are reliable because they follow laws, ordained paths which they travel, laid down by God. Now, the heavens declare the glory of God, the character of God. You look up, you see design, you see beauty, you see law, you see order, symmetry. Isaiah 6 verse 3 says, the whole earth is full of his glory. Hmm. We have heaven, we have earth. Psalm 91, the heavens declare the glory of God. And the Bible defines glory as the character of God, not just a bright light. Sometimes it means a bright light, but essentially the glory of God. When Jesus prayed to the Father in John 17, 22, he said, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them. But they did not have bright light. He meant that godly character that they developed as a result of his teachings and his influence. So we have glory in the heavens. and No matter where you look, you see the heavens. We have glory all over the earth. And the Bible says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Meaning when God created, he placed in creation evidence of his presence. But that evidence will remain undetectable to the, un, to the dishonest mind. God placed in heavens and earth evidences of his presence. And so the heavens declare the glory of God and the earth is full of the glory of God despite the pollution and the destruction of the environment. The evidence of God cannot be avoided. As a matter of fact, let me say this, and perhaps upset a couple of evolutionists. To deny God, you've got to go through this world blind. Blind. You must ignore a leaf. You must ignore how a fruit develops. You must ignore that a horse gives birth to a horse and not to cats. You must ignore the laws that govern nature. You must ignore that. But when God made the universe, being an artist, God signed it. And the signature, the evidences of the presence of a supreme being in heaven and in earth. Every classical expert, whether it's Mozart or Mendelssohn or Handel, you can listen to the music, you can identify it. It has a certain style. That's Mozart's style, Handel's style, Mendelssohn's style. Every artist, this is Picasso's style. This is Monet, this is whomever. You cannot do a work of art without having something of you enter that. You read a book, this sounds like Shakespeare. This sounds like Midroom. This sounds like Ernest Hemingway. This sounds like whomever. You look at creation, that looks like God. It must be God must be God. There are too many evidences that there's a power behind this. Creation, the Bible, science. Science that is true is science that, that cooperates with the Bible, not the other way around. Let me say that again with theological arrogance. Science that's reliable is science that agrees with the Bible. Yes, the Bible is not a scientific book, but whenever it deals with science, it is absolutely correct. So when the Bible says it is he that sits upon the circle of the earth, it tells us the earth is round. For those of you who believe in a flat earth, go read the Bible. When the Bible says that God weighs the wind, it was thousands of years before people realized the wind had weight and occupied space. But the Bible said that long time ago. It is not a scientific book, but when it deals with science, it is absolutely reliable. Science, creation, the Bible, and science, my friend. What a beautiful triumvirate. The Bible tells us how it happened. Creation shows us the result of God's work. And science, honest science, to prove, yes, this book is actually true. May the Lord bless you as you acknowledge this creator of heaven and earth. 
as you in the honesty of your mind realize there are too many evidences of to the creator for me to deny his presence. And as you go to the word, that the word may guide you, the word of the creator, his word written by him in his own way will guide you so that you can negotiate this world in which you live in a way that allows you to be ready to meet Christ when he comes. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for those who listen. Father, let the spirit work on their hearts today, God. Squeeze the heart with love that they may yield to the claims of truth. For those who are studying, bless their studies, Father. Help them to remember Proverbs 1.7 and Proverbs 9.10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Help them to remember that in Christ is hid all the treasures of knowledge from anatomy to zoology. In Christ is hid all the treasures of knowledge. Again, bless all those who listened. A double blessing on all our guests who are not Adventists. A special blessing on any little child who may be listening. Bless that child's mind to realize there is a God, a big God who loves little children. Protect all the nations represented by this audience, God. Heal your people from coronavirus. Keep us faithful. Save us when you come, I pray from my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm just waiting to see if uh, someone will speak. Excuse me. Hmm? You can be silent. Are you on to speak right now? I'm finished, but I'm waiting for a response. Well, there's no response. So. Yes, it's in there. Mm -hmm. yeah. I put away the food last night. Oh, you're a nice person. Hello everyone, um, I'd like to thank you for um, being patient and for staying up to this time and sincere apologies again for the delay in um, 
coming through octopus the skit completed this message um would like to uh, extend our sincere apologies again um for the delay in starting the meeting earlier on and tomorrow we invite you to join in again um the information will be communicated on a poster and we'll be sure to confirm this information so that we uh, avoid um, today's um, situation again. Otherwise, we thank you and we wish you a blessed night even as you go back to sleep. And we'll meet you tomorrow. Amen. Okay, so we're free to leave at this point and uh, we hope to see you tomorrow. Thank you. Hello? Yes, yes, yes.